Welcome to Church on the Rise. It is our hope that you are encouraged, enriched and enlarged as you listen to this week's message. Well, good morning. My name's Kelly, for any of you who don't know me. And um, I'm on team here with my husband, Michael, um, here at Church on the Rise, Caloundra. And it's my privilege to be sharing with you this morning a short message as we come together on this final Sunday of 2019. I personally find this quite a reflective time of the year. And um, as we come towards the end of a year, I know some people like to do it every time they have a birthday, some people don't do it at all. I tend to find towards the end of a year, I reflect over the year that has been, and I give some thought to the different areas of my life and the different goals that I've set. And it just causes me to think a little bit about where I've been and where I'm going. I often think about the goals that I set I'm a person that tends to write down or type up my goals and put them on the back of my walk-in wardrobe door and I think about them and pray about them and just check in with them from time to time. You might think about goals, but you might not write them down. But towards the end of every year, I just think about my goals and I think, did I achieve them all? What could I have done to make it a better year? I often think through each area of my life, like my family, my work commitments, my relationships, I think about my finances, I think about my health and so on, evaluating each of those areas about how well I did in those areas. Um, what I often do once I've gone through those is, oh, didn't meet that goal or, you know, I only got halfway through that goal. I reevaluate then for the following year. Maybe a lot of you are not like me and you don't really think about it. You're just going from one year to the next and things are working out well for you. But I tend to be a bit of a goal setter and I like times of reflection where I can think about these kinds of things. But recently I thought, how often am I actually doing this? And you might be the same. How often am I doing this from a motivation of wanting to get ahead in life and wanting to set myself up for my future, but from a humanistic worldview? How often are our thoughts and our plans actually tainted and influenced by a worldly perspective that I need to prioritise securing my future now? Recently, I read an article titled Secure Your Future. And the article was all about the urgent importance of making sure that you have um, injury and sickness insurance, life insurance, that you've written a will, that you've nominated um, like an executor over your estate and, and all of that kind of thing, you know, like power of eternity, of eternity and um, <laughs> etern- <laughs> let's give it a third attempt. And these are all important, by the way. I'm not talking those things down. Like most of you, we have those things in place. I'm not talking those things down. It's important to think through all of that. But this article actually went on to say that financial security is of paramount importance and it's actually of so much importance to the extent that it should outweigh all other factors when you're considering where you're going to live and how you're going to live. I was shocked that the message behind the whole article was basically uproot your family, move to the city if you have to, move remote or rural if you have to, leave your church, leave your community, um, relinquish any responsibilities basically at the drop of a hat if there was a financial incentive. Work longer, work harder was the message. Have less time with your family and friends. You'll have time for that later on in life because your career and your financial security are of paramount importance. Now, Michael and I, like most people in the room today, have had financial struggles from time to time. And the temptation has been that we sit down, we crunch the numbers, we try and make the the budget to balance, We consider who can get a better paying job, but don't worry, church, Michael's not going anywhere. Who can work longer hours? Who can get a second job? Because we are in a financial struggle. So your brain goes straight to, I've got to fix this. We've got to solve this. Who can work longer hours? What can we eliminate or take out from our expenses so that our budget can balance? Only to realise that we're doing all of that brainstorming and all of that hard work from a humanistic perspective. As Christians today, as Christ followers, 
the thought of securing our future should be approached very differently because we acknowledge that God is in control and we acknowledge that our lives should be surrendered to his will and his direction. But who knows that it can still be tricky to find that fine line between self-direction and God direction. That fine line between self-wisdom, I think I've got this, and between God wisdom, between self-help and God help so that we don't cross over into humanistic worldly thinking. Matthew chapter 16 verses 24 to 26 in the message version, Jesus gives it straight to his disciples. They're having a conversation and he doesn't hold back. He says, guys, anyone who is intending to come after me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. This is Jesus speaking. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? You see, Jesus invites us to follow him, but he warns us in this scripture that if we intend to follow him, if we intend on living the life that he has purposed for each of us, then we must let him lead. Jesus is in the driver's seat when you become a Christian and you acknowledge him as your Lord and your Saviour, you and I are no longer in the driver's seat. Jesus says to us, guys, self-help is no help at all. Yes, we've been given common sense by God. Yes, we've been given an amount of wisdom and understanding by God. But our common sense, our wisdom and our understanding are utterly incomparable to his I don't think we could even say here today that our wisdom is kind of good and God's is better. So, okay, we better take God's advice because it's slightly better. It's actually that there's nothing comparable to his wisdom, his understanding, to his guidance, to his purposes and his plans that he has for our lives. We can sort of help, but only by living each day in humble obedience before him. Okay, so if self-help is not going to secure our future, if taking matters into our own hands and directing our own lives is not going to secure our future, what will? Well, the answer, of course, is found all throughout the Bible, but the key passage of Scripture for this morning comes from Proverbs chapter 23, verses 17 to 18. In the New King, King James Version, it says... Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. In the message translation, it says, Don't for a minute envy careless rebels, but soak yourself in the fear of God. That's where your future lies. That's where your future is secure. Then you won't be left with an armload of nothing. In the Passion Translation, it says, Don't allow the actions of evil men to cause you to burn with anger. Instead, burn with unrelenting passion as you worship God in holy awe. Your future is bright and filled with a living hope that will never fade away. I find this to be a fascinating scripture, especially the translation in the message, ver- message version. Don't soak, your, sorry, soak yourself in the fear of God because that's where your future lies. I find it to be fascinating because it starts out with a warning. It starts out with God saying, Do not, not even for a minute, let your heart envy the life of a sinner. He's saying to us, Don't envy those who don't serve me. Don't live and don't live surrendered to his will. And I think this warning is similar to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23, where it says, Above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart because everything you do comes from your heart. I believe that God placed 
the warning there, do not let your heart envy sinners because he knows that it can be hard for us at times to not envy those who are in control or seemingly in control of their own lives and they seem to be succeeding quite well. It can be hard not to desire a life where you call the shots. You can do anything you want. You're answerable to no one, especially if the result seems to be an easier, richer, more comfortable life. Would you not agree? I'm sure we've all got friends, we've got family, they're living life their own way, no regard for God and his plans, his purposes, just chugging along their own path and they seem to be doing just fine. And I think God kind of knew that when he put this warning, don't let your heart envy those people who are not living to please me. So instead, to safeguard ourselves, God gives us the solution. And the solution is be zealous, be fiery, stay passionate for the fear of the Lord. When we stay humbly surrendered to his lordship over our lives, when he remains in the driver's seat, like the scripture we read earlier, our future is secure. Don't look at the temporary benefits of living with you in control. God is saying, fix your eyes on me. Worship me in holy awe. And you won't get caught up in all of that that will fade away. Yes, we've got family that have big houses, amazing jobs, luxury holidays. They've got all of these things, but we all know that those things will fade away. And there's nothing wrong with those things if they're in the plans and the purposes of God. Fix your eyes on me, God is saying, and you won't get tempted to get caught up in all that will fade away and you won't be tempted to envy those who don't live to please me. So church, are we focusing on circumstances and taking matters into our own hands, trying to help God along a little bit by securing our own future? Or are you and I handing over circumstances to him, trusting our future into his hands? In Luke chapter 18, the Bible gives an account of a rich young ruler who faced the same struggle that I'm talking about. In Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 23, it says, A certain ruler asked him, asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honour your father and your mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, Yes, but you still lack one thing. Sell everything that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when the rich young ruler heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Now, the rich young ruler's response to me indicates that he placed his trust in riches. He thought that his future was secure because he was very wealthy. That was a predictable life to him. He knew where his future lay because he had all of this money and he imagined himself safe for his future behind his wealth. He desired eternal life though. We know that from the scripture. Like you and I, he was somebody who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved is basically what he's asking. What must I do to inherit eternal life? So he had a desire to know God. He wanted to know, how do I get to heaven? How do I please you, Lord? And so he had that desire there. He had that hunger there. And he said, I've kept your commandments, God. I've done all of those things that you said. But yet he couldn't trust God with his future by obeying Jesus' instruction to give it all away. And what does the Bible tell us? He walked away sad. He walked away sad because he couldn't trust his future over into God's hands. He kept all the commandments. He wanted eternal life, but yet he couldn't trust God with his future. Living in that tension between the seen and the unseen Living in that tension between faith and sight is not wrong or right. It just is a reality. But will we walk away like the rich young ruler, sad, unable to have faith, unable to place trust in what God says? 
Or will we be like Peter, who at Jesus' word put down the nets again? In Luke chapter 5, in the NIV version, it says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. It's a new kind of pulpit, really. When he had finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, and other translations of that scripture say, Lord, at your word, I will let down the nets again and obey. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knee and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. Now, Peter was exhausted from working hard all night when Jesus comes along and essentially says, Peter, will you trust me? It didn't make sense to his natural mind. For those of you who have been in church, you would have heard this scripture before. And it's obviously a miracle that had happened. But for Peter to actually consider, he'd he'd worked hard all night. He knew there were no fish in that part of the lake or the ocean. He was like, we've tried that, we've done that. It didn't make sense to his natural mind. And so if he was motivated by a humanistic worldview or humanistic thinking at that point in time, Peter would never have experienced the miracle and the increase that he did. Peter would never have been given that opportunity to experience an aspect of God that he'd never seen before. Peter's level of trust and dependence on Christ increased dramatically from this experience. You see, I often think that, well, we all think at times that our future lies in our parents or our boss or our spouse depending on how they treat me and the decisions they make, well, that's, that's going to affect my future. That's where my future lies. We often think that our future lies in financial security and we imagine ourselves safe behind that. We often think that our future lies in education, in knowledge, in career advancement. The media often peddle, of course, that our future lies in beauty, in success, in popularity and pleasure. But how often, church, do we actually stop and consider that our future lies in soaking ourselves in the fear of God? We think through all of these other things that can affect our future, but have we actually considered that it comes from a place of surrendered worship before Him? How often do we think, yep, my future's secure? when we worship God in holy awe and live from that place. See, there's a contrast to be made here. We are told that our future is bright and filled with a living hope when we burn with unrelenting passion to please the Lord as we worship God in holy awe, not when we burn with a passion to advance our career or to increase our wealth for selfish reasons. And the Bible certainly doesn't promise that our future is bright if we strive to become famous or more handsome or successful. No, our future lies in honouring and revering the God who created each of us and by allowing him to lead our lives. In fact, the Bible states that this key passage of Scripture from Proverbs, it says that if we don't soak ourselves in the fear of God, we will be left with, can you see it there? An armload of nothing. 
If we don't live in humble obedience to God's direction for our life, we will get to the end of our life and realize that everything we've strived for, everything we've busted our guts for was of no real value anyway. So where does your future lie in 2020? Where does your future lie 10 years from now in 2030? Or even 20 years from now in 2040? Will we walk by faith and not by sight? Our future doesn't lie in what we can see. I know it's very tempting. Michael and I live in the real world in real time. And sometimes it can be much easier to place your faith and your trust in what you can see, in what a mortgage broker can tell you or what an insurance company can promise you. But are we going to walk by what we can see or are we going to walk by faith by the word of God? The thing is, though, is a life of following Jesus means a life of unpredictability and a life that sometimes, like to Peter, didn't make sense to his natural mind. Why doesn't it make sense? Because God is bigger than all of that. God is bigger than time and space and location and money. And the plans that he's got for each of us here today are bigger than those factors as well. Matthew 8, verse 18 to 22, Jesus said, we know this scripture quite well, where Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? Is he having a pity party that no one cares about him? Is he having a pity party that no one's prepared him a nice bedroom to sleep with a nice fluffy pillow? No, of course not. Jesus was saying, and I'm sorry I don't have time to um, expound all of that scripture there. There's a lot more in that verse. But essentially, Jesus was saying, guys, when I'm on earth, I am about my father's business. He was saying, if my father directs me to go here, I will go here, whether there's a nice pillow or not a nice pillow. If my father directs me to do this or to do that, I will do this or I will do that because while I'm on earth, I will do my father's will. I am about my father's business. See, Jesus knew that his future was bright and secure when he lived each day in the fear of God worshipping God in holy awe and reverence, completely surrendered to God's will, not his will. But today, do you and I know that? Do we live each day knowing that our future lies in fearing God and submitting to his will and direction for our lives? He's the one who made us, church. I'm so thankful for God's incredible patience and love for me, And the way that he gently and lovingly corrects me when my thinking goes a bit warped and a little bit off track. And recently I was having a bit of a heated conversation with God about a few different decisions for us for the future and our girls and their education and their growing and and their learning and all of that. And God said to me, really, Kelly? Really, you think that by doing this, this and this, that that's going to secure your children's future, your future, Michael's future? Really, you think your wisdom is better than my wisdom? Okay, so you know what's happening in 10 years' time from now, 20 years' time from now? Proverbs 28 verse 26 says, Those who trust in their own insight are foolish. But anyone who walks in wisdom, that's a capital W because wisdom is God. Wisdom is Jesus. Wisdom is the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. But anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be foolish. I don't want to walk according to my own insight, my own limited understanding, my own limited wisdom. I want to be safe. I want to be safe and secure in God's wisdom, in His understanding. We can't listen to the world's advice or the world's wisdom in how we live and the decisions we make for now and for the future. We must walk by faith and not by sight, saturating ourselves in the fear of God because that's where our future lies. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 33 says, First pay attention to me. This is God speaking. First pay attention to me, then relax. Now you can take it easy 
you're in good hands. Church, our future is secure in him. It's not secure in anything else other than him. Could I invite you to stand with me this morning? We're just going to take a few moments now in whatever way you feel comfortable, no pressure, just to say thank you to God for 2019, for the good, the bad, the ugly, and to commit 2020 to him. You might not be at a place right now where you live in complete surrender before God. You might be trying to do a bit of a a tandem type thing where God drives a bit and you drive a bit. He's in the driver's seat sometimes, you're in the driver's seat. You know, like a long road trip, they're fun. Michael and I have done a few with the girls camping before. And, you know, Michael hardly ever lets me drive, so this is probably not the best example. Um, But, you know, if you do a long road trip, you kind of share the driving because one of you gets a bit tired, so the other one takes over. But the thing about God is that He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get exhausted. He doesn't get worn out. And He can actually do a perfectly fine job in the driver's seat of our life without any help or input from us. Amen. So can I encourage you that your future is only secure when you live from a place of faith in God, a place of humble obedience to His Word, both His written Word and His spoken Word to you personally. When you live to please Him alone, that is when your future is secure. Soak yourself in the fear of God, for that's where your future is lies is the word of God to us today. Could I encourage you just to take a few moments now just to close your eyes and just in surrender before God, thank him for 2019. Thank him that even though there's been things that were not particularly enjoyable, that were challenging, that were difficult, maybe heartbreaking for you, the good, the bad and the ugly, 2019 has happened and God has been with you every step of the way. Even at times when you don't think He's there with you, He is. And can I just encourage you to take a few moments right now with your eyes closed, just to commit 2020 into His care. You're safe, church, when you're in His care. When your attention is on Him, your desire is to please Him, your life is surrendered to Him. Like Peter, it might not make sense to your natural mind, but at your word, Jesus, I will choose to obey. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's message. If we can help you in any way, please get in touch with us via the web at caloundra.churchontherise.org.au.